Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to our next uh, webinar showcasing our latest and the newest product release uh, called CPR. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, thank everyone for waiting uh, these two extra weeks. I know you've been anticipating this product, uh, but due to an extenuating circumstance, we have to push this back for these couple of weeks. Uh, um, so uh, thank you for that, and we apologize for this delay. Uh, but we are so excited today to be here with you, and thank you for joining. Uh, we are so excited to present the CPR product with you. Um, so I'm here. My name is Omid. Uh, in case you haven't been following these webinars, I'm the research and development manager here uh, in the products, and I'm here today with my colleague Amir. Hello, I'm Amir, and I'm the uh, head of manufacturing here at CPR. Yeah, so we are here today to uh, present to you this. Uh, the structure of today's webinar is we will have some uh, presentation slides that we'll go over. I'm going to be sharing my screen. Uh, and in the meantime, we also have our chat window open. And so if you have any questions throughout the presentations, please uh, post them in the chat. And our colleague here behind the camera, Matthew, will be uh, collecting those questions and we'll take them between the slides and also at the end, we'll have an open discussion there as well. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna share my screen over here. Okay. All right, so let's talk about sit here. Yeah. All right, let's get started. So uh, let's introduce the CTR. So what is the CTR I mean? So CTR, as the name suggests, is a monitoring uh, station and device to measure the air quality uh, around the city. Um, so uh, the inspiration for this product was that we developed many different solutions for many applications, such as drones, uh, fixed stations like our Sentinel, uh, but we saw a lot of demand from our customers uh, wanting to uh, measure a whole city, like a city-wide air quality. Um, so we saw that we wanted to make something really practical and applicable. Exactly, yeah, something that's yeah. Uh, easy to deploy, uh, that's cost-effective for multiple deployments. And, and low operating costs as well. Exactly. So, um, that's why we came up with this product, uh, which uh, includes the most advanced sensing that we've developed today to date. And, um, uh, we're going to go over that and explain to you what it does, how it works, and how you can deploy it in place. Okay, so uh, as you can see so far, uh, this is, uh, you can see a solar panel over here. So it's kind of indicating what this power is coming from, but uh, in terms of overview, maybe you want to give a structure of that? Sure. So um, I can, uh, you guys can see my camera right now. Is that possible? Yeah, let me. So we have two units with us today, actually. Um, so we'll start with the basic unit, maybe if you can show that. Yeah, so here to my left side, you can see uh, our self-powered unit, which is powered by a solar panel. So this unit includes batteries in them that will uh, keep itself charged and throughout the operation. Uh, so as you can see, this unit is pretty light uh, and relatively small. And uh, Basically, it mounts on uh, poles or walls that we're going to talk later as well. Um, mm -hmm. But this is fully self-powered, so for deployment across where power is the next option. So we also have uh, another unit with us here. Uh, this unit, uh, show you briefly. It's uh, this unit has a, a camera at the bottom that's used for vehicle detection and vehicle count. So actually, this would be set up uh, nearby a road, and you would select exactly which uh, which area you want to count the cars, and it will count. Uh, buses, cars, vehicles, um, and pedestrians, pedestrians as well. As well yeah. 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 So that was a very general overview so far. Uh, I'm just going to switch back to my slides. Uh, okay. All right. So as you can see here in this photo, uh, I'm not sure if you uh, noticed it, but if you see on the top side of this photo, you can see the city here mounted on a pole. Uh, so this is how it would look like being deployed in an urban environment. Uh, but basically, uh, how this works is basically it measures the air quality uh, where wherever it is mounted, and it collects all those information, presents the data in a very easy to understand graphical interface, and um, we can basically monitor the area throughout the day and night and throughout the whole year actually to see what we have in that environment. So do this lightweight structure, we can deploy this pretty. Um, easy uh, anywhere with minimal effect to the environment. So we don't have to drill anything anywhere and stuff. Exactly. All right, so we'll briefly go over all the uh, specifications of the unit. Um, 
Before we do that, I'll just, uh, just want to mention that the unit, uh, we didn't really cover it earlier, but the unit samples from the front, from the top of the unit, and uh, it's pulled through the sensors and exhausted at the bottom. So um, the, the maximum number of sensors that we can have is uh, 11. We have uh, four electrochemical, which is uh, you can choose from our uh, long sensor list. Uh, we have one CO2 sensor, a PID sensor, a methane sensor, a particulate sensor, as well as temperature, humidity, and atmospheric pressure. Yeah, so these device actually measures uh, once every second, and it takes one minute averages, and it reports uh, every one minute. Uh, so depending our, actually because of this application of uh, long-term, long-time program monitoring, we wanted to have this, we found that one minute averaging is the most reliable way of, uh, or data interval for this application. Um, so the typical unit to my left-hand side is uh, 4.5 kilogram with the solar panel. Uh, so it's very easily deployable by one person. There's no need for uh, heavy equipment for installation of this anywhere as well. We'd be uh, more than happy to send you a drawing of the, uh, of the unit itself if you want to kind of model it in your own system. Uh, we'll be more than happy to send you that if you just email our support team or our sales team. Yeah. Now, in terms of the unit itself, if you are at the location, you can look up the unit itself and you can see a color changing LED displaying the unit status. In case something is going wrong uh, or uh, if some things that you want to know how the unit is operating, you can just look up and see based on the LED indication of what it is. Um, now this unit, as you saw, there's no uh, wires to it. So it communicates through uh, many communication methods that we can customize. So here we have a list of few options here for you. Mm -hmm. So we have Wi-Fi, 3G and 4G networks, and also the LoRa uh, communication. We'll yeah. talk about detail. Yeah, we'll go over that. Uh, just one thing I want to mention is that uh, uh, these communication methods are not all of them that uh, we're capable of. For example, um, if something such as narrowband uh, 4G or CATM1 uh, 4G that's available, as well as uh, most of our modems have 2G fallback in case you lose your connection. Exactly. Also, yeah. So uh, in terms of the power requirement, uh, as you can see, there we have the solar power version on my left, and we have the AC power version on my right. Um, it typically takes uh, 110 to 240 volt AC inputs, but we can customize these and also combine it, the two together, so we can have both uh, as well. Uh, so very flexible on that. Um, so this uh, this uh, device basically is a cloud-based uh, monitoring, so where everything is logged, analyzing, and all the alarms uh, through the cloud, and we have a central uh, remote management system where we will go in detail later. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the alarm, unlike our AQ safe unit, which has onboard alarms, this unit does not have for uh, the way it is going to work. Uh, but the alarm is being set on the cloud. All those uh, cloud features that uh, we talked about in the previous uh, seminar, um, such as SMS texting, email alerts, will all be available, but it will be done through the cloud service. Um, so uh, we, we researched this a lot and saw that, okay, uh, what's the typical operating range of temperature and weather environment for this application? These units will be mounted outside and outdoors in harsh environments, and we extended our temperature, operating temperature range now, it is from negative 40 to 40 degrees Celsius, and uh, uh, we ensure that our sensors and our devices operate well within this range. Now, in terms of talking about the sensors, we, we have our latest technology, which is the device health check, uh, which is basically an algorithm and runs on the board itself or can onboard the units that checks the health of the sensors and provides sensor replacement reminders if it needs to be. These are done uh, once per day, every 24 hours, um, as well as uh, the server itself will uh, can be configured to send you a reminder for when uh, calibration should be done, um, how long it's been since the last calibration, when the last time a sensor was changed. Yeah, of course, um, in, in case the sensor needs changing, uh, we'll have it covered in the first 24 months as part of our uh, warranty. Um, we have a new interchangeable sensor design in this, which we'll talk later. Um, and as we said, the mounting is possible on a wall or pole mount. Yeah, we'll also talk yeah. more about that later. Yeah. And so the battery runtime actually is something interesting. Uh, we got a few questions about this. And so uh, the unit itself without solar power will last about 36 hours just running on the battery for the base model. And so we decided on this time to be enough for a service technician uh, to go to the location and probably charge or replace the batteries or um, figure out what is going on with the solar panel. Um, 
What uh, a unique feature we included in this is the traffic information as we uh, uh, briefly mentioned earlier. So we have a vision-based traffic classification and counting, which will uh, help us correlate our data. So let's say there's a lot of traffic going in a, a city and we can correlate these two together and figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, so our design is, uh, our, our unit is rated uh, IP53, which is perfectly uh, perfectly used for outdoor setting. Um, this means that it is uh, dust tight and uh, it can withstand uh, rain. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so in terms of backup, if something were to happen in the communication, uh, which is quite rare, uh, we also log the data on the SD card on the device itself. So uh, you won't be losing any data. Exactly. Our SD card is capable of holding uh, over two years of information. Two, so three years. Even more. That's not something you would have to worry about. Yeah. So in terms of the access, these units will be mounted uh, pretty high. So it's not so much accessible to the general population. And so we also have an option of securing the device lid by uh, a cable or a padlock, which will further um, increase the product uh, uh, security in the location. Uh, we, of course, uh, part of our regular procedure, we calibrate these units in factory and we document our processes here. And so we have the ISO 9001 uh, uh, certification here. Exactly. We'll also talk about how you would calibrate your uh, instrument later on in the slides. Yeah. All right. So uh, we utilize many different sensor technologies um, to get the best accuracy and the best results. Um, so here's uh, on the screen, you can see a couple of different technologies that we use. Uh, for example, a laser scatter technology is used for uh, high accuracy measurements of the particulate matter. Um, in our case, we measure bins one, 2.5, four, and 10, um, as well as an option for uh, total suspended particulates. Um, we also use uh, metal oxide sensors for different uh, uh, chemical gases. Um, if you're interested in measuring a broad range of VOCs, uh, uh, photoionization detection is something we would use. Um, and then we also use, for example, CO2 or uh, CH4. We would use uh, non-dispersive infrared technology. And mm -hmm. uh, most of our sensors, our chemical sensors, are used. Uh, uh, we use uh, electrochemical cells for that. Yeah. And uh, of course, depending on your application, we uh, study these technologies deep and we can recommend, uh, um, depending on your application, we can recommend the combination of these uh, that will work best for you. Uh, here's a brief uh, list of what kind of pollutants we could measure. Um, uh, so these are something here that we can, for example, pick and uh, depending on your application, let's say if you want to measure uh, some pollutants for an urban environment, we come in nitric oxides, nitrogen dioxide, uh, a CO and so forth. Um, so this is just a very brief list. Uh, for a more comprehensive list, please uh, visit our website and we have the full list there available for you. Uh, but you can always call us to consult uh, uh, we're happy to help you with selecting these. Exactly. We also offer uh, uh, noise detection um, as well as uh, traffic counters we talked about earlier, uh, wind speed and direction, um, and many more. Uh, just feel free to ask us and we'll be happy. Yeah. Okay. One of our new features of uh, this, which uh, we implemented in this product, is the interchangeable sensors. So, what basically that means is that when it's time to change your sensor, uh, or for example, when you purchase the unit, but uh, you want to have different sensors for different uh, deployment applications, uh, you can have these uh, sensors swappable. So you can basically open the lid and just basically pop these uh, sensors off and just replace them with the pre-calibrated one that we can uh, send you. Um, so that helps us with uh, faster repair and troubleshooting and also like very fast deployment and easy deployment for you as well. Exactly. So you wouldn't have to send the unit back for reconfiguring it. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So multiple deployments of the units for different uh, applications is entirely possible on the same unit. Yeah. Okay, so we'll uh, briefly go over all the different uh, mounting uh, options. So uh, the one that we've been using more often is pole mounting, um, which is uh, which is on the unit to our left. And, uh, and essentially you use those uh, uh, metal ties to wrap it up, tie it around the pole and secure it. Um, another option that we have is uh, wall mounting, which uh, is used by uh, those feet that you can see in the middle and uh, right side. Um, and uh, that would just be used for mounting it directly onto a wall. Yeah, exactly. So um, depending on, um, let's say if you're in an environment where there's no pole or any walls, uh, you can also put this on a tripod um, because it's very light and 
They're usually multiple on uh, multiple platform. Okay, so if you happen to purchase more than one of our units and you want to have them connected together, uh, we have the option of meshing uh, these units together, as shown here. Um, so these units are networked together and they form a grid around the city. And one of the most important things about the city monitoring is that we want to have real time and parallel information coming from all the units together at the same time to our server that we can see the results. One of the yeah. strengths of having a lower mesh network is that if one of your units uh, happens to go down, uh, for example, it's solar powered and you're not getting sun in that area or uh, your power goes down, mm -hmm. um, you won't lose communication from the other nodes, uh, from your other units. Essentially, what will happen is the units will automatically reconfigure the path to send data to your uh, local, to your, um, to your main station mm -hmm. um, by, uh, by hopping the data from one, one point to another until it reaches its destination. Yeah, exactly. And so um, we mentioned that this go to a gateway, right, Amir? So exactly. how would they go to our server? Okay, so yeah, they would all send data to one main gateway and uh, through that gateway, either through cellular or Wi-Fi, it would uh, pass in, uh, information to uh, our Sims 2 server, which combines visualization, AI data analysis, and it has an elastic search uh, database, which is used for quickly processing the data. Yeah. Okay, as we mentioned earlier, this is a cloud-based monitoring where everything is sent to this uh, Sims 2. And uh, we're gonna talk in detail of what we can do in there and what we can see, but this is a very brief overview of how it looks mm -hmm. like. Yeah, it's uh, mobile friendly and yeah. you can access it anywhere in the world. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Wherever you are in the world, you, as long as you have internet connection, you can manage really, remotely manage all these units uh, from there. Um, so uh, another feature of this device is that we have the optional traffic camera uh, that you can put on this unit. And so you can see here that is mounted in an overhand setting where we can have a view of the traffic, of the pedestrians crossing by. And uh, so uh, this is basically a non-contact vehicle counter. So usually the vehicle counting is done by a wire run across the street, uh, which requires deployment every time. Uh, but this is uh, purely vision-based. So our algorithm is able to distinguish between different uh, vehicle classes. So cars, trucks, bicycles, motorcycles, motorcycles, motorcycles exactly. All that. Um, so all this information will be reported on a cloud service mm -hmm. in uh, different bins. So you'll be able to tell exactly how many trucks pass by, how many people walked by, uh, and all this information will be available for you to correlate with your uh, chemical data. Yeah, we found that these are very valuable information because uh, sometimes in urban settings they're going to be a heavy, for example, truck uh, passing by. And so uh, a lot of pollutants can accumulate in the environment, but without actually knowing what happened. So it's very difficult to see uh, why a certain area in the city was polluted or not. Now about the weather conditions. So this unit is ideal for any weather. Uh, so here you can see uh, we have winter, summer, all four seasons here, uh, temperature ranging from negative 40 to 40. Um, the waterproof casing will allow us to put this and just deploy it and forget about it, basically. Um, we've done extensive testing and we continue to do testing to improve our devices uh, as we go along as well. Exactly. Yeah. So um, uh, a lot of uh, questions might come up saying, oh, well, how would it work from negative 40 degrees? So uh, we actually implement uh, a system inside here, which depending on the environment will adapt and provide the uh, sample uh, air condition that is required for the sensors to be operating normally. Exactly. Um, so we have, uh, as we spoke about earlier, we have uh, many different communication options, but uh, one of our strengths is that um, we're, we'll, we're ready to um, find a different way to integrate our system with your network so that you don't, there's no upfront cost from using our units. So for example, uh, uh, the reason actually we, we thought of this is that uh, if you want to combine your uh, city airs with your AQ safes, um, we've uh, thought of different communication protocols which will be used to integrate them. So uh, here's just a, uh, uh, an array of different uh, communication different communication methods that we can use. Yeah, yeah, great. So uh, a new another new uh, feature of this uh, product and also. Uh, among any other product that we have, which is on Sims 2, is the advanced reporting uh, function or the feature. Uh, so what it does is basically just by a press of a button, uh, you can generate a report. It could be a weekly, monthly, or yearly report. And it, it not only does uh, generic algorithms of displaying data, 
It also applies some smart algorithms to detect patterns of uh, how the pollutants change over time and where the hot zones were uh, and at what times even throughout the day we've been seeing those. Um, and it can show you also the general trend of the pollutants. Exactly, yeah. We, we try to present the data in a very easy, easy, uh, easy to use, easy to visualize and, and see exactly where the hotspots are. Yeah, so basically after one click, uh, this report is generated for you and you can quickly uh, distribute it amongst your colleagues and just discuss uh, saying what the pollutants were in the environment or what you can do in terms of action. Exactly, and this can be done in a custom time frame. You simply select the time frame you like and uh, and hits generate and the, the report will download for you. Yeah. Okay, before we jump into SIMS 2, I'd like to pause here to see if there's any uh, questions coming in. Um, I think we have any questions so far. Okay. All right. Uh, I have one quick question for you guys. Yeah. It was a private message. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're looking at this system in comparison to, let's say, the Sentinel SL50 unit, mm -hmm. what would you say the main variances are? Okay. Uh, in terms of variances, so uh, comparison to our SL50 unit, so these are kind of different units. So SL50 is a fixed uh, mobile station where you uh, deploy it and it has a, like a built-in air conditioning system. Um, and so uh, it's quite heavy for being mass deployed throughout the city with multiple numbers. Exactly. Um, the Sentinel is also more used for, uh, it can have more sensors inside of it. So for example, uh, here we're limited to four electrochemical sensors, our Sentinels, um, you can have up to 12. So um, the Sentinel is more used for uh, more gases in a more uh, industrial area like this. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, but the aim of the city here is to have it a uh, low cost and budget friendly option where you can deploy it, yet we be able to get lab quality measurement of the mm -hmm. pollutants in the environment. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so Ulysses would like to know, what are the limitations associated with the humidity operation? Oh, sorry, that's how I would like to know that question. So what are the limitations associated with the humidity operation range? Right, so the humidity range was uh, from 10 to 90%. Um, so uh, the extreme is actually from 5 to 95%, uh, but we're coming from 10 to 90%. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as there's no condensation uh, risk, uh, and then the device should be operating normally. Exactly, yeah. and in the odd chance you're in 0% the humidity, there is a slight chance that the cells might get damaged, but it's a very rare scenario. But uh, in the real environment, the outdoor environment is Hardly ever possible to reach yeah. that zero. Um, All right, so this is would like to know what's the difference between methane and methane calyotes? Right, so the methane sensor, we typically refer to low level methane sensor where you can detect off gassing from farms, uh, whereas the LEL is the lower explosive limits, which is yeah. much higher levels. Exactly. So depending on the application, uh, we're coming either or. Uh, or sometimes both even. So yeah, essentially the difference is just the range. Uh, just the, range the LEL has a higher range, but the resolution is lower. Mm -hmm. And the regular methane sensor is a lower range, but higher higher resolution. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I would like to know, is there an influence of temperature on the measurement since it does not have air conditioning? Uh, exactly, that's a great question. And that leads us to continue with our presentation. So please stay tuned and then we're gonna go over the data and show you actual results of how that works. All right. All right, let's talk about SIMS2. Uh, so maybe, maybe you wanna give us a quick question? Sure, so um, if anybody's familiar with our old uh, SIMS server, uh, we've developed SIMS2 um, and improved upon it. So um, there's some of the strength of our SIMS2 server is it's uh, much faster. It can uh, process a lot of data and visualize it for you very quickly. Um, it also offers many uh, analytical tools um, and you're able to view historic data, run diagnostics, and configure various settings on your CTR. Yeah, so basically it's all the one package where you can access and do all of those tasks in one place. Um, so this seems to talk software here. You can see a snapshot of the uh, main screen when you log in. Uh, so here you can see it provides an easy uh, analysis tool for you for any operator to use. Uh, so we uh, optimize this interface so to include to decrease the training time needed for the operator. So we basically open it up, and it's a very intuitive interface. Uh, it can be exactly. up and running in a few minutes. Probably. Exactly. Yeah. So as soon as you log in, you see all your units uh, deployed on a map, um, and then from there you can select any unit, view the data, um, view any alarms that might have been triggered, and yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, so yeah. Go on. <laughs> so, uh, 
So yeah, uh, in the analysis page, you can quickly view uh, sensor graphs and, and the, the trends over time. Um, and here you can analyze the data. You can uh, download data from this page as well. Um, you select your time frame, and you can download data for that time frame. You can even uh, generate a report based on that time frame that you selected. Um, and it just makes it simple to uh, to kind of quickly analyze your data, see see the trends. Um, we also have event based uh, 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 event based uh, logging, so you can log in events uh, that happen at that time, and then later view your data to see exactly what happened, what has happened. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, also, you have the option to export the raw data. So some of our customers are interested on performing their own analysis, uh, fitting it through their own algorithm. So we also have that option here as well uh, from the server. Uh, so on this server, we have a, a page where you can uh, see all the sensor settings, all the settings related to the management. Uh, so these are some advanced layout here where we have, uh, you can put actually the sensor sensitivities and manage the sensors there to see if there's any shift needed. You can all put them in here. Um, yeah, as well. Exactly, yeah. Um, and if you also have a custom uh, AQI um, uh, range that you want to you wanna set the sensors up for, you can do it through here, uh, as well as uh, you can set, uh, it'll send you reminders of when the last calibration was performed and when the next one needs to get performed. Um, and uh, you can view the old calibration from those. Yeah, so this is uh, this is per device. So if you want to come for maintenance, as Amir said, always come here and uh, look up and do most of the stuff here. Um, so we also have a smart notification system. So Amir mentioned briefly earlier that uh, this is much like the AQ Safe. We can have all the SMS or email based notifications, right? Exactly. And yeah, so we can uh, have that set up for CPR individually per unit as well. Exactly. So you can set it up, for example, if uh, uh, H2S exceeds a, a certain threshold um, uh, three times over five minutes, then, uh, then it'll send you an email, it can send you a text message, it'll send you a, a visual alarm on the unit, exactly. on, the, on the server. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and also like you can put rules here, for example, if you're monitoring a city, you can expect that NO2 levels and NO3 levels are kind of uh, the opposite of each other usually. So overnight you can set, oh, if the time is uh, past midnight, uh, we expect this to go up and if doesn't happen and shows an anomaly, you can set it and get an alarm based on that as well. Now here you can see an expanded view of what it would look like if you have multiple units. So actually every CTR comes uh, with a GPS uh, built-in. So if you were to relocate one unit from one pole to another location in the city, the location will update on this map uh, as well. Uh, so uh, you don't have to really configure this yourself. So here you can see, for example, two units are being uh, showing an alarm and the two other units being offline right now for what they were using. So you can click on the individual units and come up to see what the status is or what's going on and easily manage the, all the groups in one location. Exactly. And if you have uh, multiple deployments, you can group those deployments together. So for example, uh, five of your city areas are one deployment, five in the other. You can easily view just those five or just the other five. Um, and all that can be easily done through subcategories. Yeah, exactly. So let's say you want to measure all the roads uh, within one group, and then you have your facility, and you want to deploy a few CDRs around your facility. You can all set that up and group them together as such. Yeah. All right. So now it's a good uh, time for us to take more questions. Uh, so let's continue with that. All right. So Focus would like to know. Is it possible to put more EC sensors or more particular patterns with one CPR? What if the air temperature overtakes 40 degrees? Does it stop operation? Mm -hmm. So in terms of the PM sensor, I can talk and say that one sensor is sufficient for the accuracy levels that we uh, are designing for. Um, yeah, one thing I'd also like to say is that uh, that one sensor measures, uh, when, when we group yeah. those sensors together, it's uh, PM1, PM2.5. PM4 and PM10, it sends yeah. all four of those. Um, I think we we are working on uh, putting in as well as those four at TSP, uh, something that we're currently working on and uh, we hope to be able to include that as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, however, we're limited to four electrical electrochemical sensors per instrument. And if you require additional sensors, as we said, we can have this as interchangeable sensors. Uh, yeah, or you can all, always ask us for customization so we can include uh, even more sensors, we're adding additional boards uh, or uh, customized box for you as well. Uh, that's, that would be a possible. Exactly. Yeah. All right. 
So oh, so sorry, there was a part of that question that I missed, I believe. Uh, she asked if we can exceed the 40 degrees, what will happen? Yeah, so in terms of the temperature, um, we will get an alarm on the system on SIMS2 saying the temperature is being exceeded. So the device will continue operating. So, uh, but the reliability of the sensor data will decrease as such because this is not an air conditioned system. And uh, that's basically re reaching the limit of the uh, sensor chemistry at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, Anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, we're also uh, investigating putting a, a, a micro air conditioner on these units and something we're looking into that uh, we'll keep everyone posted on. Yeah. All right, so what kind of sensor do you use to measure methane at PPM? Yeah. Um, for our PPM level, it's a, uh, we use uh, two different kinds. It depends on uh, where you're deploying it. We'll either use a NDIR sensor or a uh, MOS sensor. All right, cool. So Amy would like to know, are the sensors used in the CPR the same types of sensors with other sensory products, such as the flying lab products? Uh, yes, there are many sensors that are used across the products here. So, um, but uh, the ranges of the sensors that we pick and we choose that are based on this application are quite different. Uh, because this unit, for example, has a very uh, slower response time rather than say the drone, because the drone requires a very fast response time uh, to capture all the fast moving emotions. So, uh, but this unit is more for suited for sticky application measure. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's some uh, bigger sensors that we offer that uh, they cannot be put inside of a DR2000, um, but that can be put inside this unit. Yeah. All right. And what I would like to know, did you open the box to see inside? Sure. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, I can do that and show you how easy it is. Uh, so I'm going to open this in the number of units. Yeah, there we go. Show the other unit. So the way to open this uh, in field is very easy. So there are two latches here that you can open up. And then here, this is our prototype unit here. So there's a few wirings here. But this basically, this is how it looks like. So we have the battery pack over here, and underneath there's boards and the sensors are facing down under the unit. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you our unit that is equipped with uh, the camera for traffic counting. Uh, so if we open up this unit, actually doesn't have any batteries. Um, but uh, so you can see, uh, we have our cellular modem on this side. We have a cellular antenna that's actually um, hanging down underneath. We have uh, a separate, uh, computer that we use for uh, processing the visual data and counting the, um, the, the traffic. Um, and then uh, this unit is actually gonna be installed on a light post with uh, AC power. So we have our uh, AC adapter here. And uh, yeah, as you can see, the, the air flows from here underneath the sensors and out from the bottom. And then we have a camera at the bottom which connects to our, uh, to our cellular uh, gateway. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay, so there's one more question. All right, so if you're operating in the UK, what would the, sorry, would the user provide the SIM card or is that provided by us using a world set? Right, so uh, our units are customizable for different locations of, because of different uh, radio frequency requirements. Uh, mm -hmm. But in terms of SIM card, uh, yeah, we can uh, we can provide one for you if you like, but typically we uh, allow our customers to, uh, to put in their own SIM card. That way, if they have a Existing uh, existing plan or uh, or an existing uh, like an existing network, they can use that. Um, if you would like more information on which bands we cover um, to see if it will work with your network provider, we'll be more than happy to send that to you. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Let's move on with uh, our presentation and answer some questions that are already outstanding about the uh, results or the output of this device in different conditions. So. Here, uh, we're going to start with the temperature and relative humidity, which is a uh, basic uh, comes with basic of every uh, city that we would purchase. Uh, so here you, see, you can see a graph of temperature and humidity plotted over uh, a couple of nights over here. So the green one here is the temperature over here, and the uh, yeah, red one here is the relative humidity. As you can see, as the temperature rises, the relative humidity drops, and you can see. Uh, we have very uh, wide crazy weather here in Ontario. In Ontario, <laughs> going from four degrees to 23 degrees over in one night. So um, you can see that here, and this is how a data visualization would look like. You can filter the data and select which to present over here, and you can kind of see what correlates to what on this 
single graph. And here you can see our uh, unit being mounted on our top of our roof. And then here's a comparison of the temperature reading uh, with the station uh, 10 kilometers nearby to us, uh, showing the good, great correlation here. Now, if you have a solar charging and uh, self-powered units, uh, you might want to consider monitoring the power uh, characteristics of the unit over time to see if there's a need for replacing the batteries or exactly. if there's and a maybe problem. upgrading your solar panel or upgrading your batteries. Yeah, so in terms of the solar panel, uh, we do recommend monthly adjustments of the angles of the solar panel and maintenance of the solar panel as well. Um, so but what you could do is you can come up here and select these uh, settings here. So here you can see uh, the yellow plot over here. Uh, that shows the current flowing through the device from the solar panel. Essentially how much uh, energy you're harvesting from the sun. Exactly. And the blue one is showing the state of charge of the batteries. So you can see over three nights, you can see uh, during the day, it charges up and then overnight it discharges and the cycle continues. So some days are cloudy and you don't get as much charge, but then some days are really good uh, sun coverage and you get the full charge during that day. Um, so this is a very useful tool for you to estimate your local uh, solar uh, irradiance and also measure how much how the device is performing throughout those times. And of course, if you want recommendations on what how to orient the device, uh, please consult us and we'll be happy to help you with that as well. Now, uh, getting to the real sensor data, here we can see the NO2 sensor here. So we have this unit mounted on top of our roof here, measuring the ambient environment, uh, the outdoor, um, we also had our analyzer, which is an EPA certified unit uh, mounted close by to it. So we were sampling both together to compare the data collected together. So here, the blue line, you can see that's the CPR NO2 sensor readings, which is being overlaid on top of the orange one, which is the result from the analyzer. And so we're looking at levels of from zero to 10 to 20 ppb over here. And here you can see the internal temperature of the board still swinging from 25 degrees to zero degrees. And one of the earlier questions was how does the temperature uh, change the sensor behavior? So we apply a preparatory algorithm uh, uh, to these sensors here. And we actually characterize the effect of humidity and temperature on these electrochemical sensors. And that's how we can compensate for uh, all those variations and uh, get the actual readings from the sensor this way. Exactly, it's something that's done on all our uh, all centric products. Yeah, we have an option to, um, um, this is part of our calibration and we uh, uh, go through this process for every sensor that we have to. Now here's a sample of our ozone sensor, uh, which is basically the inverse of our NO2 sensor because as the ozone levels rise, the NO2 levels dip. So you can see here, we have low nitrogen oxide, but we have high ozone uh, readings over here. Uh, so this is, by the way, done over four nights. So these four peaks indicates uh, four days. Um, and so you can see the ozone sensor are also pretty close with our uh, EPA certified analyzers. We're looking at the ranges of 30 to 35 degrees over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And here's the uh, correlation data here being uh, plotted here. So we have the R value of very close to one. Uh, so we're very happy with this performance and it exceeded our expectations. Uh, after our design. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's quickly talk about uh, the different ways you can calibrate your CPR. Yeah, so um, of course the CPR comes calibrated uh, at the factory, but uh, depending on the operating time and also you might need to recalibrate over this. We have a few methods. Uh, so method one is a co-location using uh, US EPA approved reference station, which is the most accurate way of doing it. Exactly. So maybe you can go over and sure. So how you do that is first you would uh, bring the all the city areas you want to uh, calibrate uh, close to the uh, US EPA certified uh, reference station. So um, the good the good part about calibrating this way is that you can calibrate all your units over one day. So you bring all your units close to the analyzer, uh, and then you record data uh, for twenty four hours. Mm -hmm. um, the more data you collect, the more accurate the calibration will be. Um, just to make sure that we get all the different uh, ranges. So um, what you do after you collect all your data is you download the data from your uh, reference station and you download all the data from your CDR. And then you give both of these uh, files in uh, CSV format to our uh, Sims calibration module, which is basically on our cloud server. And uh, through our powerful uh, AI algorithm, we will perform a full calibration 
and it will output to you a calibration certificate as well as um, the calibration parameters for you to enter into the cloud service. Um, and obviously, once that's done, you would reinstall them in, in their location. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you happen to not have access to a USB approved uh, reference station, uh, another option would be to co-locate uh, these devices using a mobile reference station. So an example of that is our Sentinel SL50 unit, uh, which is already calibrated by uh, with near uh, reference accuracy. So what you do basically, you will bring all your secure units and place them uh, and co-locate them with the Sentinel. And you basically run through the same procedure as the Amir described. Exactly. So you can wait for 24 hours, and that's the minimum recovery that we recommend. You can always go more, capture more data. Um, and then you can upload the data to SIMS, and then uh, you can have the calibration done exactly. as well. Uh, you can also, instead of bringing all the units to your SL50, you can bring your SL50 to those units. Exactly. Yeah. So you can do them individually one by one without having to install or reinstall the units. Uh, they're not required to bring it to a Sentinel per se if they have their own instruments as well we can exactly uh, use time. that as Definitely. well yeah yeah and the third method is actually using a direct uh, calibration using a calibration gas uh using our gd600 product uh so this is for cases where a reference station is not available um uh, we recommend this because this is a more affordable uh solution where you can just bring the device to the site uh where the city is installed um, what you do basically, you install the inlet to the sit here and then run through the operation guide of the GD600, connect calibration gas to the GD600, and then uh, so the device will provide zero air to the units and also the calibration gas, and you can calibrate per sensors. Uh, so, roughly, I think it will take about three hours to do, depending on the number right. of sensors you have. Yeah, of course, it will scale with the number of sensors yeah. that you have. Uh, yeah, so the GD600 will actually dilute your gas canister, so you won't be using a lot of gas. Um, you can also, if you need to, you can also uh, directly input the gas canister to the unit for a one point calibration or verification. Yeah, like, exactly. yeah so this is a uh, perfect spot now. We have lots of questions coming in, so uh, let's go through them. All right. Uh, so, the first question that we had here does this unit have a built in GPS? Yes, this unit does have a built-in GPS, and as you saw on the map on scene two, this uh, location of this device will be updated automatically if you were to relocate the device or install it for the first time. It will automatically pop up in the right spot where you install it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the GPS receiver is actually located inside of the unit, so there's no need to position that or anything like that. Exactly. And also, uh, one more important thing is that from GPS, we also get time, and that's how we sync all our data together, and we make sure that our data corresponds to the correct time. As well. All okay. right. Uh, is the sample air pumped to the sensors or is it passive? So the sampler is neither actually. So we have a, a negative pressure inside the box uh, created by a fan and also a preparatory air intake uh, design where the air comes from top of the unit, as I explained earlier. So you can see kind of hidden behind here. We have the weather resistant inlet here where air is being drawn in. Uh, and then exhausted from the bottom side. So we're not using a pump in this, and this way uh, we don't have any pulsation happening, and uh, sensor readings are more uh, less noisy, basically. Exactly, we avoid any contamination that could happen by using a pump as well. Mm -hmm. So we just simply pull the air um, from the sensor faces and out the one. Now, not to also mention the, uh, uh, the uh, lifetime of the product, this way we have longer life than a pump. Exactly, yeah. 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 Do you use an ozone generator to calibrate the O3 sensor? Right, to calibrate the O3 sensor, yes, we recommend generation on site. So um, you can always do that. You, you can connect it to the inlet and do the ozone calibration that way as well. That, that's if you uh, don't want to use a reference analyzer yeah. to calibrate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How far away uh, were the NO2 and O3 EPA monitors in the CPR units when doing the comparison? Yes, so the intake of the analyzer and the CTR were about like uh, 20 centimeters apart. So they were very close to each other. Um, so we tested them as well by providing gas to the units at the same time to make sure they're matched in time. Uh, we calculated the R square value, as I think I showed earlier, uh, it was uh, more than 92 or 94 percent, uh, with some days reaching actually 98 percent. So it's very, very close. And that is, of course, after our algorithm uh, applied to the sensor readings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
right. So I just believe you answered the second question. Did you calculate an RQ value when you were doing comparison? Yes, yes, we did as well. All right. Uh, how often is the calibration check required? Right, so in terms of calibration check, uh, I think you may mention that there's, uh, there's an online system where it reminds you of when the calibration is needed. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that, we, yeah, we recommend uh, calibration every six months. Uh, however, you might need to perform that every 12 months. I mean, um, we recommend not going over 12 months. Um, for checking, uh, three months is an option if you want to just do a, like a check. Um, but we definitely recommend calibration every six months. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Also, for, um, uh, for example, uh, for a device where the sensor is exposed to extreme conditions outside the requirements, um, we also have sensor hull checks that will detect if there's any damage done to the sensors. So you can always um, see that happen, get a lot for that. Okay. All right. So, last question for you this is what are the available options for wind speed and wind direction for the CPR? So we offer uh, two different options. Uh, the first option is the option we recommend is the ultrasonic wind sensor, um, which uh, which which measure which measures both uh, wind speed and direction. Um, the other option is sort of a kind of like a wind vane option that we have, where um, it'll as the wind blows, it'll turn uh, these cups, which will measure the speed and uh, and it'll also measure the direction. But for uh, more accurate uh, readings, we recommend the ultrasonic wind sensor. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, uh, so that was the our, uh, the end of questions. Are there any questions? Uh, so if you have any more questions, please email us. Uh, any of us will be happy to uh, help you with that. Uh, I'm sure the copy of this uh, slide will be available to you if you want to go over it again. Um, if you have any questions later on, please do tell us. Uh, so finally, I would like to thank you for being with us today. Yeah, and uh, yeah. And a very happy holidays to everyone out there. Absolutely. Yeah. We wish you a very best. Uh, hopefully, a better start next year <laughs> <laughs> as well.